Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast with your host, Eric Van Horn. And today's guest is Alex Samios. Uh, he's with Dogtopia, and we're going to get into his background, the team that he's built at Dogtopia, both as, uh, with franchisee experience and franchisor experience. I'm super excited to dive into this as, um, as this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And I think it's important having franchisee experience on the franchisor side. Um, so I want to dive into that with him. But there's, you know, the the pet industry, the pet boarding industry is a super fragmented and crowded space. And so um, I know that they're doing some incredible things in that space with Doctopia. So I'm looking forward to diving into that with him as well. But Alex, uh, thank you for taking some time and welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Good to be here. Good afternoon. Absolutely. Um, why don't we start out like how in the world did you get involved in the franchising not necessarily even to dogtopia yet but just in franchising in general uh it started a long time ago i guess uh for me uh 40 years i know i don't look that old but <laughs> uh <laughs> i grew up in a franchise family so uh, my father was the first franchisee for jiffy loop the automotive company uh literally 40 years ago uh last year so as a kid i grew up in and around the business fell in love with the franchise model, uh, grew up working uh, in, in his stores. He, he, was a, he had a multi-unit deal. Uh, he ended up opening, opening a couple. And so I ended up working in that environment, fell, falling in love with it. Uh, I saw the power of the franchise model at a very young age um, and, and, and just fell in love with it. Uh, from there, right out of college, I went to work for an emerging brand, which has uh, gained some notoriety of late, but uh, Papa John's Pizza uh, went to work. <laughs> uh, they had only at the time about 450 stores. No such thing as bad press, right? Right. Uh, or, or bad founding. Fan, fan, <laughs> some bad comments. Uh, anyway, <laughs> out now, but uh, anyway, they were just, they were booming. Uh, and I, got, I went to work for them and built out the Denver market, uh, working for corporate operations. So really got my hands dirty. Uh, in ground level operations and loved that. I worked for them for about two years and then uh, had the opportunity to franchise with them, uh, which I did. Uh, and with that opportunity and just the kind of tailwinds in that sector and the amount of financing that was available and the unit economics and the ROI, uh, I was able to grow very, very quickly. And fast forward four years later, I had 34 restaurants open with them and was nominated franchisee of the year for a couple of years in a row. Uh, it was great. So I was in that system for a total of 11 years. Uh, as I said, I had uh, 34 uh, units and, and over a thousand employees. And uh, that was a great experience. How old were you at that? I started when I was 24. So young. Yeah. Um, I grew up. Uh, yeah. I started when I, I think I was like 24, 25 when I started as well. Yep. And uh, so it was a great opportunity. <clears throat> I was the, one of the youngest franchisees in our system. And, and, uh, uh, but having worked for them and having you know, run their own stores, you know, they hadn't had too many franchisees that actually had run a store first. Um, and so I, they, were, they really helped um, my growth aspirations and gave me a lot of opportunities to grow. So I did that. Um, and along the way, I kind of as, the, as it was built, I liked growing things. And so by the time my stores were built, I, didn't, I was looking at some acquisitions, but uh, I got kind of bored and said, hey, I got a great team. I got a great system. Uh, I had strong you know, double digit you know, sales growth um, and was looking for the next thing. And uh, I grew up with labs, grew up with dogs, saw what was going on even back then. So 20 years ago, this was yeah, in 2000, uh, I signed the first franchise agreement for a mobile pet grooming company uh, that was based out in California. They had just come to the U.S. They were expanding. I bought the first territory, and I saw just then, back then, if the mobile grooming was kind of a cool thing. Hey, you know, we could pull up to your house, and, and the, we'll, we'll groom your dog right in front of your house, low stress. Uh, you could sit right there. They could still look out the window. So it was a great opportunity. So Not brick and mortar. Correct. Whenever someone's in brick and mortar, the grass is always greener, right? So you, you've been in brick and mortar, mobile looks super attractive. Mobile, right. Uh, and so we did that. 
and I was on the board of that company. We, and it really helped to expand the first 30 units or so. Uh, after that, uh, I had sold, a, I sold my, sold my uh, franchise in that uh, and then did some other things. Fast forward, uh, once I got out of Papa John's in 2008, uh, I, I was consulting and, and really I had launched my own concept as well in the health and wellness industry. So I started a concept um, and then franchised it uh, and then eventually sold that. And, and so I you know, it was fortunate enough to have grown up in a franchise family, then worked for a franchisor, then became a franchisee, then was, my, was a franchisor myself and built a concept from scratch and expanded that. And so it was really, as you see, kind of wore a lot of hats and kind of well-rounded in that sense. Um, fast forward to uh, four years ago, which is when our current ownership group bought Dogtopia. So uh, I'm one of the partners and investors in the, in the brand as well. And uh, the initial team that uh, had uh, driven by our, our, our chairman, Peter Thomas, uh, they, they had found Dogtopia it had uh, at the time 26 locations for a company, uh, a founder who had kind of taken it as far as she could go. And, and there was a real opportunity uh, to come in, take Dogtopia and, and build upon it. So with that, did you put together that investment group with the intention of going out to buy a franchise and look for a franchise with a number of units open with the founder not ready to grow it? Was that the original intention? You didn't have the concept in mind yet? Yeah, so I wasn't in the, the initial group. So Peter, I put an initial group together to do that, to search for an opportunity. And it was a lot like these other, uh, these, these other uh, groups now that are investing in emerging stage brands. And the concept was, let's go out and invest in you know, eight or 10 brands, give them the back office, the sales, the support, the finance, and, the, and, some, and some fuel to grow. And, uh, more, and, and then he'd found Dogtopia. Is that, a, is that a dog I heard? Yes. <laughs> what kind of dog? What kind of dog do you have in the office? Silver Lab, and he, he was just dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> I just went out um, before we got on. I looked out, and I have a Bernie Doodle. She's about thirty-five pounds, and she had like something in her mouth that she wasn't supposed to have. So we're 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 a big dog family as well. Love it. Yeah. So um, so that initial search group led by Peter, they had identified. Dogtopia negotiated a deal and bought in. Uh, after that, he went on the search, and I was in talks with him then, went on the search for a CEO, got, the, got Neil, our CEO, and then right after that, uh, I joined the team. I was the second person really to come on board, joined the team to launch the, the franchise development side uh, and, also, uh, and also invested in the brand from that stage on. So I wasn't part of the initial group, but came in right after with the CEO and invested and then we kind of took it from there. So uh, again, it was a, a brand much like the industry, you know, the founder had done a great job kind of building it, but like many kind of run out of, run out of steam. And, and there was a lot of um, uh, brand, uh, there was no branding. There was a lot of uh, franchisees just doing whatever they wanted, no, mm -hmm. consistency, no brand standards, uh, no alignment. Um, and, and so, we took it from there and really laid the tracks down. And, and, and it's Well, let's talk about that. Let's land there for a little bit because I think there are people listening to this podcast right now. Two things. One, they're listening to the dog. So this is perfect. Having a dog, dog sounds in the background. This is, you know, <laughs> this is great. Let's get a picture of that dog. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Silver lab. Um, but then having, uh, you know, people that, uh, a lot of us franchisees that have been a part of different brands, you get to the point where you're like, I can be a franchisor and you start to go down that road. And I'm in that place right now. I'm, I'm a part of a group where we are getting closer to acquiring a, a brand and as a franchisor. So this is an interesting topic for me. Some of the stuff that I'm going to be asking is like really personal. So uh, to, to where I am. So like the teams together looking for, they, they found that brand. They are now have acquired that brand, whatever that looks like. What are the first things that you guys did? You, you know, you have to talk to the franchisees and like, Hey, we're now partners. You know, you weren't partners with, you know, you were partners with so-and-so now we yeah. are the new management team. And what, what happens day one in, in the franchise, the new franchisor? Well, so there is a level of mistrust right out of the gate, right? And so 
uh, understand yeah. listening to the franchisees uh, and understanding, you know, what, what's missing. There wasn't a lot of support. There was no support at all. Actually, there's no systems. There's no tools and resources, five different point of sale systems. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a real mess. Uh, and, and so the first thing was understanding, you know, what they wanted uh, and, and building just tr building the trust that we were going to, we were going to give them what they wanted and, and listening was first, right? So go out, we did a lot of time in the field and just listened to what, what they needed, what they thought was wrong, what we needed to fix. Uh, and, and so the, and laying those tracks were first. Um, I, I would jump back before that we let everybody go, the existing team. Hmm. And not that they were bad people, it's that they were not franchise people. Uh, and we wanted to bring in experienced folks. There was most of the corporate support team was focused on supporting the four company stores, not the franchisees. Hmm. So they, they didn't really understand what it meant to be a franchisor. And so uh, we cleaned house, moved everybody. We were based in Virginia, moved out to, to Phoenix where we're based now and really started developing our own team and bringing in that experience. So that was first getting the right team on the bus. Then it was listening to franchisees, talking to them uh, and understanding what they needed and, and what was working and what wasn't working and then putting the plan in place. And that took a good 12 to 18 months to, to, un, to lay the tracks and get everybody on the tracks and aligned with the vision of where we wanted to take this and then the plan was, you know, let's, let's start rolling out the proper support. Were you selling franchises at that time or was there a pause on selling franchises? There was no pause. I jumped in and, you know, you know sold eight deals in the first quarter. And part of and what today, what I still am selling and why I'm so effective, I mean, I've sold uh, over 115 locations this year alone through, through September. And part of it is, which is very strong, by the way. Anybody that doesn't understand, like, you know, the, the uh, selling a hun over 100 units, you know, in the first three quarters of the year is very, very strong. Right. And it's, it's, it, it was just based on the fact that I was selling a vision. You're coming on board today. There's a lot of broken things, but it's going to get better. And still today, I mean, our, our same store comparable sales were up 32% last year. They're up 26% this year. Those are huge numbers if you're yeah. advertising or retailing uh, comparable sales. And so we're still selling tomorrow. The model is better today than it was yesterday. And it was better yesterday than it was, you know, two days ago. And if you would have looked at the financials coming in in 2016 compared to today, you're like, geez, why did you buy it? Like, how did you sell that? And it was, it was everybody believed in what we were doing and everybody believed in the industry. And that was the other thing, mm -hmm. you know, that industry data was so strong that guy if you if you couldn't make money in this industry with the right brand and the right people and the right support with the right system something was wrong and and so we knew we had a good kind of model to start with but that box now is very strong and, and if you look out four years from now it's going to continue to get better and so that was important is selling that the future vision of where we wanted to go Let's talk about the team. So, you know, I know that you have franchisee experience, franchisor experience. Is there any industry experience in on the team and where does that fit in? So I'd love just like, if you were explaining to somebody that is a novice and thinking, how do you build a dream team? To, yeah. Like who is, who is that? Well, it started with uh, our CEO, Neil, who's got 40 years in franchising and not in pet, but has built some great brands uh, the last one was a, a, a coffee brand that expanded to 1,200 locations across the U.S. and 38 countries. So uh, he lives, eats, breathes franchising. Mm. That's the thing. Uh, franchising, as you know, is a very unique animal, and not a lot of people understand it. And and, and so it takes franchise that background first. The other thing, which which you'll laugh, but it's it, it is true. The similarities between child care and pet care are so close. <laughs> So really what we're doing is dogs have become people's children and yep. we do daycare, which is our main driver. Uh, we're, we're watching people's children and yep. their babies. And so we didn't see a, there was, there wasn't anybody like in the restaurant industry, you could go out and, and pick a 20 year veteran in the restaurant industry. There wasn't that in the pet industry. And so I mean, PetSmart and Petco were the biggest retail and the retailers. 
There wasn't anybody doing daycare boarding on a national scale that we really could, could pick from, steal from. So we went to the next best thing, which we went and got some great childcare professionals. That, and so it started with our VP, Kathy, who has spent 20 plus years with kinder care. And then she recruited, she brought a whole team with her. So we've got all these folks from childcare that built some great childcare brands. And, and then we also went and got a couple of childcare franchisees out of Primrose schools and those folks. So that childcare piece was our kind of industry knowledge. I love that. And, and because I mean, you know, dogs are men's, you know, man's best friend and, you know, and like before my wife and I had kids like our dog that we had a german shepherd and that was like our kid now we have friends that don't have kids and they have dogs and you're like wow were we really like that <laughs> i think we were and at least she was i'll make sure that she listens to this to know i i said that but you know but it's true so would you did you guys like how did that conversation even happen because i think another key thing that some people may miss like that's where you got your initial franchisees too because that was that that same type of uh, customer avatar that would, you know, used to doing childcare, now doing dog care, very similar. Um, but like, was that just you guys sitting around, you know, drinks one night or a boardroom where like, how did that even come about? Well, the, the humanization of the dog has driven and we, we talk about it all the time. So in understanding the industry was constantly mentioning this idea of dogs becoming our children. And, and so, if we couldn't go out and get experienced uh, folks who, for the team that had that pet experience, the next best thing was that childcare. And it, and it was, hey, really started first with, hey, we need to, what industry can we recruit from? And that's the other thing, you know, when you look at these verticals and say, what, what, what kind of experience would a multi-brand franchisee, if I could choose one to come into my concept, mm -hmm. Would that be? And I've got some. I've got the largest Orange Theory franchisee. He's got seventy gyms as a franchisee of ours. That, Dogtopia was his first diversification out of the fitness, mm. and and that was it. It was like if they were going to diversify, what would it be? And I tried restaurants for a long time. Nobody from the restaurant industry wanted to, to touch this, and because restaurant guys, I, I was one of them. They're, they're restaurant guys. I no restaurants. I don't give me more restaurants. And it's like mm -hmm. I think now they also thought, oh, the pet industry. That, that's a joke. You know, that that's silly. I mean, you can't make money on the dogs. And so I think they're, you know, they're coming around now. But so it was really, hey, let's go get some child care, talk to some child care franchisees and see if they'd like to diversify. And, and then on top of that, so it was kind of a both like, hey, let's go get some team members from there and let's go get some franchisees because that was the closest thing they, to the emotional connection and engagement mm -hmm. that, they need, that we need in our business, they had. If you're good at watching kids, you'll be great with dogs. It's, as I say, it's a lot more fun. It's a quarter of the cost and there's no liability. <laughs> <laughs> um, so people probably have an image in their mind of, you know, as they're listening to this, of what Dogtopia is. Like when someone, a customer walks in with their German Shepherd or Bernie yeah. Doodle or Lab, like what's going to happen? And they probably have a, a visual of what it is and it may or may not be accurate. So can you paint that picture for us? Yeah, so our primary service is daycare. And that's almost 70% of our revenue. So, you know, crazy to think 10 years ago, we would be taking our dogs to daycare, but just like children, uh, dogs in daycare, especially if they start them young, they learn socialization, they get exercise, they get engaged. And what we say, you know, they ultimately become a better canine citizen. Dogs in daycare, <laughs> they learn to play well with each other. And just like we send our kids to learn basic social skills and the dogs do the same thing. And so the proliferation and popularity of daycare has exploded in this country. We saw it coming years ago because if you look at 10 years ago, we were a boarding company, which is the overnight piece that did some daycare. Now we're a daycare company that does some boarding. So the services have kind of flopped and the future, especially with millennials now, the female millennial is the largest dog owner. She's the biggest spender and they're the largest demographic group in history. So, and they love daycare. So we set out to be the best daycare operator. So that's what we do. Drop your dog off in the morning, come back and pick it up at the end of the day. The dog stays with us for the, for the day, plays in our open gyms, playrooms we call them, with supervisation, super, super, supervised uh, with our canine coaches. And we divide the dogs by their size or temperament. So 
based on the size of your dog and how active, you know, an eight pound dog would, would never be playing with a, a 90 pound puppy. Uh, <laughs> but we separate those dogs, but it's daycare for dogs, essentially number one. The second business is the boarding. That's the overnight. Uh, we, we were not a kennel. That was the old name for it. Uh, hmm. We're a modern hip fresh daycare center, but we do provide boarding. It is important. And, and uh, that, that's just like, we're not a pet hotel. We're not a kennel. What's a uh, pet hotel? Pet hotels, uh, there's, a, there's uh, some of them out there. They're kind of these luxury boarding suites, right? That your dog can sleep on a queen bed with a fish tank, a TV, classical music playing, and they charge 150 bucks a night. I mean, it's ridiculous. But there's a niche for that, a very small niche. We're mass market. That's a very small niche. You can tell I'm not the pet hotel customer, obviously. But, um, like, I mean, we're dealing, we're leaving tomorrow on a vacation, my wife and our three little girls. Uh, we're leaving in the morning. And we are, the local place where we board our dogs is, is full. And they're not, they're even full during the doggy daycare time. And we don't, we're not in a big enough market to have a dogtopia. So um, I wish there was one around here, but you know, like it just, I like in this small town where we live in and they have a lot of space there. It's like the demand is amazing. I, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. And I have friends that one's going to Hawaii and they're like, does it, you know, does anybody have another place where I could board my dog? And there's not, and it's, it's crazy. Well, that's the demand. And that's what we saw four years ago. We looked at the country and went around and you saw these independents because that's the industry is very fragmented. It's dominated by independent mom and pop upwards of 15,000 of them. I mean, that's more than Starbucks. They're everywhere. Mm. And, and they could be run out of somebody's backyard or their house, you know, and uh, with wet, with Rover and dog vacay and wag these apps. Now you can on demand somebody to come which is very scary because uh, there's no training or certification there. You don't really know what's going on, but uh, that's what we saw. We saw these, you know, this kid, well, I remember one showing up and the kid was, had a tank top on, was playing hoops, smoking in the backyard. There was like 60 dogs in, uh, uh, you know, up in the backyard and they were packed, you know? And so there's all this money being made, all this demand, but God, there was no professionalism. There was no sophistication. There was no health and safety. There was no convenient locations. Uh, it was all being run in this mom and pop. And that's what franchising is, right? If you look at it, mm -hmm. it's uh, taking these mom and pop businesses and, and making them into a national brand and putting support and systems and professionalism around them. And then, you know, giving those tools and that model to a locally owned franchise operator in that market who lives, eat, eats, and breathes that brand in that community and is that brand ambassador. And that's why it's so powerful. It works. So no, yeah. that's exactly it. And then, so like talk about the, like your mindset going into a super fragmented crowded space. And like for you and I, I mean, that's just normal. That's franchising and pretty soon there'll be more competitors and you guys are, you know, I think you guys are, are you guys the largest right now? We're second. We will be the largest next year. You guys are growing fast. We're and the fastest growing brand in the entire pet space and have been for three years. Well, let's take a little tangent. Like, why are you the fastest growing? And I'm sure it has something to do with your leadership team and the franchisees that you're bringing on. But if I'm wrong, correct yeah. me if I'm right. Like I said, started with the team and, and we built a, a unparalleled level of support. So that's what you need to know. For We just opened our 120th store. Um, open. Open. 120 open, and I've got over 250 sold in development on top of that. We'll be at 400 by 2023, the end of 2023. But we've opened these stores, and guess how many team members we have in the support office? We have 48 wow. people for, a, a, it's almost two to one ratio. So that right there, we have invested heavily to over support our franchisees during this heavy growth phase to make sure everybody's getting taken care of. So Team, yes, but really not just everybody says support, support. We really do. We've got 48 bodies here to support fifth, you know, roughly uh, 100 plus stores. Well, that 100 store mark is a big mark too. Any franchise or that gets over that 100 mark is a, is a big deal. And just I'm sure, you know, now you're at that, that tipping point where you can start to get a lot, of, a lot more of them open because you have franchisees that are getting ready to open up multiple units. Like how many are are multi-unit owners now or will be? Uh, right now open, it, it's, it's, you know, under 20%. Uh, 
Uh, but if you fast forward, most of my new, most of my deals in the past couple of years have all been area developers. So they're just now, you know, it takes a year to get open. So they're just now getting comfortable with their first. They're going to yeah. be open second, third, fourth. Uh, we've, you know, I've sold as many as, you know, uh, you know, large deals in the teens and up to one, one franchisee has, has bought 34 licenses. Those are the largest. Here's an interesting topic. Um, I don't think I've really talked to anybody about this, but I think it's really important. And that is, you know, people that get into franchise and they think, you know, I pay my franchise fee. I'm going to go find real estate next week and be open and start construction right away. Yeah. And real estate and construction, it, it not, not a fast process there. Why don't you, I mean, if you can like bring some truth and some like transparency and correct expectation into people that are getting into a retail heavy franchise, like what yeah. advice would you have for them? Um, I can't wait for another recession. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, landlords, real estate, uh, and specifically contract or construction costs mm. are up 40% in the past four years. These contractors are so busy. It's like, boom, you know, just launching in these bids. So, you know, mm. I, I don't mean that for businesses to be hurt, but I can't wait for a correction to slow some of this down. Mm. It's insane. Unfortunately, you know, we're looking for big space, five to 7,000 square feet. There's a very competitive in that 1,500 yep. to 2,000 foot space in that prime retail. That's really competitive. We're fortunate enough to have to these, these larger spaces, which landlords now, they've got these vacancies where the retailers yep. have gone out. Yep. So we're, we're looking at great opportunities now. The uh, and we're the trap. We we're, we're becoming the traffic generator and the anchor in the center. The landlords love us. We're bringing in a hundred pet parents a day, twice a day. We don't take up parking, and we're yeah. in, and and we're filling these big holes. The problem is we've got zoning issues, nah. so we're still classified as a kennel. So even though we have made it into retail, we're in Whole Foods shopping center. There's some cities or jurisdictions, municipalities, still say, "Hey, you're a kennel. You can't go there." You know, when we don't have outdoor, we don't need outdoor. Uh, only half the stores do. And we have soundproofing in the walls. I mean, I've, I was told Orange Theory Fitness is louder than we are. <laughs> the sound attenuation than we do. So, uh, but that's, you know, it's just a process. Any, if you're going to do real estate, brick and mortar, we say, you know, six months to sign a lease, three months to get through design and permitting, and three months to, to build. That's yep. a year. That's if a year. We, if we can get it done in nine months, great. I mean, that, that is the hurdle. We look at some of these concepts that have grown, uh, whether it's like Monster Tree, he talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. I love, love those guys and, and, and or Restoration One, you know. Yep. With, Our friend Gary. Any of those guys, you know, boom, I, I signed a franchise agreement. I got a truck, I'm in business tomorrow. Yep. And, and I can open, you know, five territories tomorrow. Uh, with us, it's like, you know, we're, I'm, I sold a three pack and they're you know, a year one, they're just getting open. Then it's gonna take them a year to get comfortable. And then they're all getting the two. So it's going to take them three years to get three open. Um, and, no, that, it, and that's, it, that's, if the real estate was there and the permitting was there and we can ramp these quicker, which is what we're doing, that, that they can grow. But uh, the permitting and, the, and just breaking down that barrier of where a kennel and educating landlords and cities, that's the hardest part. If we, ha if we knock those down, we can open quicker. So anyone out there listening, I, I think there's some some gold in there, especially around the uh, permitting and the uh, uh, local laws around some of that stuff, whether it's Doctopia or there are other franchises that you don't think about, but they might have some type of permitting issues because of the type of business that it is. That's really important to understand. And sometimes people get into a franchise not knowing that, and it really hurts them at the end of the day. And another thing, Eric, is we put together a full service real estate and construction support system now. So very rare, we have an extra fee. It's $44,500 on top of our franchise fee that we charge, but we do all of the real estate and all the construction for our franchisees. And so this is becoming more popular, like my Michael Haith at Teriyaki Madness is rolling it out. He's only charging you know, 15 or 20 something, but you know, he's like, Sammy, how are you selling? You know, basically, you've got two franchise fees. It's $94,000 to sign up with us. Mm -hmm. Nine five franchise fee, forty four five real estate construction fee. And uh, the, the difference is these are big, big projects. These are big builds. But we're now taking that franchisee, again, the part of the unparalleled support. We 
the franchisee doesn't have to get involved in any piece of that now. But, you know, once they select their site, we do we, we get the bids from contractors and then we, we do all of the uh, project management over the contract, excuse me, contractor for the 12 weeks of construction. So what's happening is in, in, in turn, they're focusing on recruiting and, their, and training their team and, and branding and starting their marketing. Uh, so it's an investment to say, I don't have to deal with this. I'm going to focus on my team and marketing. That's going to help me ramp and get to profitability quicker. So it is kind of an investment to not get distracted with that. I've been a part of a franchisor that um, as, as a franchisee that they did that whole process for me, it didn't charge us anymore. And it was fantastic. Yeah. I've been a part of them that, that I was responsible for that. And it's a lot of work. And right now um, I'm going through a build out on that kind of that sweet spot uh, space of about 2000 square feet, which is really hard to find these days. Yeah. And we're going through, you know, uh, probably a $300,000 build. And I have paying someone to do that for me. They're on my team, but that's their whole focus. And then and even then it takes my brain power to make sure things aren't getting missed because you do something one time, um, you're not the expert at it. And so there's so many things that can cost you money too. So 44,000 is a lot of money, but at the same time, it can save a lot of headaches and can save you money in the process as well. They're seeing the benefit. And remember the majority of our franchisees are corporate refugees, yep. first time entrepreneurs, first time business owners. And as you know, the hard part with them is learning to, to, to live in wet pants. It's yep. like they, they're not, once that twice a week by, or that biweekly ch paycheck stops and now they're signing their own checks and they're opening their business and they, you know, it's, it's managing that because it does, uh, it gets stressful. And that's another piece of what we do. We fly in a team. We're all on the ground with our franchisees at every opening for 10 days with the team. Uh, and a lot of, no, not a lot of franchisees, franchisors do that but we dispatch a team to every opening we're there with them by their side because it is nervous uh oh yeah that, that first opening we want to make sure we're there to support them it goes well but um yeah so this is what you're talking about with the level of support and then the experience that you have is just like what a great team that that you have and that's why you have so many people at the corporate office helping people out who are the franchisees i heard you know one or you know, large orange theory owner and Orange Theory is obviously one of the, the great franchises out there and have done very well. And a lot of those guys are looking to expand and diversify because there's no place else for them to build. Um, I know a number of different brands that are, that they're going into, but you know, obviously this is one of them. Like besides like someone like that, like who else is a franchisee or a possible good candidate for you guys? Um, well, like I said, the, the majority of those corporate refugees that you guys see all the time, mm -hmm. uh, and that there's first time owners, uh, entrepreneurs that whether they, you know, they've been kind of laid off or they've been through the cycle. They've been working for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. They've saved up. They want to do something fun. They want to control their destiny. Uh, it, and what we're, we're fortunate enough that it, it's a great family business. So I think, uh, our, our, what I'm seeing is our, our most successful dynamic is the parents working with the kids. Yep. Uh, and that dynamic, because you can't do that in a lot of businesses. No. Uh, and so the kids are really involved, whether it's the parents retired and writing the checks or the kids are kind of running it during the sweat equity or, you know, both, they are both writing checks and true partners. Uh, that's a dynamic that's working really well because you've got kind of the mentorship of the older and the kind of rolling up the sleeves of hard work and the energy of the younger dynamic. But the majority of those corporate refugees, uh, I'd say 20% uh, are seasoned franchisees diversifying out of existing brands. Uh, and then the, I'd say the other 20% are seasoned entrepreneurs. So never been in franchising, but they've built businesses of their own. And they're saying, hey, I heard a lot about this franchising thing. It's so much easier. You know, I've had to build my own companies and it's so hard doing all the heavy lifting. And, I'm going to give this a try. What's uh, next for you guys? So you're at about 120 open now. You've got a lot to get open um, in the next year or two, hoping for a recession. 
in sure. some ways to, because real, real estate is so much easier. I, I built um, in the salon suite industry. We didn't know it at the time or realize it to the extent at the time, but we were getting some such great real estate deals yeah. and construction was really- You were looking for those same big spaces. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, um, and that was nice. And then that, that definitely changed. And the, the unit economics changed as well because we were capped at what we could charge and we couldn't just market more to get more customers in that space. So that, you know, so anyway, it was a different business model. But for you, like, where are you guys, what, what's next for you? Are you going to continue to add to the corporate team? Do you have enough that, that you can scale and grow now? Because in the retail space, what's, you don't need to correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't need to continue to add team members like you do when you are in early stage growth because you have franchisees now that are opening up their second or third or fourth locations. They don't need the type of handholding. Correct. And so we want to add a couple more. We've got enough for 300 stores today. So we wanted to kind of, you know, pack those bodies, get the right people on the bus, get the bench strong. And, and we didn't want to, we didn't want to be playing catch up. So we're way ahead of the curve. So, you know, I had a couple key strategic uh, folks along the way and constantly kind of refresh the bench. But outside of that, the next is getting to 400 stores. That's our next milestone. We'll be there by the end of 2023. So just over two and a half years. Uh, you know, if I stop selling today, we've got 250 in development and 120 open. So if I don't do anything, anything else today, we'll be at 370. So now it's just a matter of we have to get those stores open. We have to get them ramp them quicker. And, and really looking out, we see a, our 10-year plan was about 1,000 stores. And that's what we see in our 10-year plan. So, uh, you know, six more years after that, you know, we'd like to be at 1,000. When you're growing and you're looking kind of short term, do you see the industry changing at all or different profit uh, opportunities for your franchisees in the future? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at, you know, how, how can we leverage technology to simplify our playrooms? And we're a high touch business, obviously. Um, and how can we do that to simplify our playrooms and, and, and add health or, or add technology to improve health and safety? Uh, those are big. Uh, things. And then also, you know, what other channels can we develop? Uh, once we have built that trust with our pet parents um, and their brand ambassadors, you know, what other pieces can we supply them? You know, whether that's just knowledge, uh, but it, it, it cultivate that relationship. And that's what we're looking for. But for right now, there's so much opportunity just in daycare you know, between daycare, boarding, and our spa services, that makes up 98% of the business. Uh, until we have stores at 95% or 90, 95% capacity uh, with, you know, and then we need to worry about, hey, how can I take this million and a half store, you know, in revenue to, how, do we, how can we bump that to two million? How can we get that to two and a half million? And that's going to come through these ancillary channels uh, and, and additional revenue streams. What's the difference between daycare and spa? Oh, so daycare is just dropping the dog off, boarding is overnight, and then spa services are a bath, ear cleaning, toe, uh, nail clipping, and grooming, which is cutting of the hair. So we call all that spa. And now with the hyperallergenic dogs and all of that, I'm sure that is, a, is growing because they yeah. need, like, we're taking our dog in all the time, it seems like. Yeah, totally. Well, and it's easy. A, a simple bath is, you know, 20 bucks, but dogs play all day. They got you know stuff alive <laughs> all over them, and then it then it hardens, and they're all crusty. They come out, and they've been rolling around and playing, and and so that's an easy you know upsell for us. Is hey, would you like a bath at the end of the day? Pick up your dog, and it's kind of he's fresh to go home. You know anything hard about the business? I mean, I, every business has hard things about it, but what are the things that you like your franchisees to know before they get into it? You're like. You know, you look great and we want you in as a franchisee, but we want to make sure that you know this thing about the business because you're going to, going to discover it at some point. Totally. Well, you know, as we talked about, we've got a lot of corporate refugees that have been used to managing 60, 80, $100,000 corporate salaried employees. Mm -hmm. We take them out of that role and say, here, manage this $10 an hour, 20 year old kid part time. And again, wet pants. And it's like, wait a minute, I just, I just hired him. You know, <laughs> train him, spend all this energy training him, and he left after two weeks. Or, you know, 
his fifth grandmother died and they're calling in and it's so it's it's managing the hourly staff and that part-time employee that most of them have never managed there's like a lot of them are managing their children like that's the you know and it's tough uh i have done it my whole life that's all the only workforce i've ever hired for the most part i had a thousand of them at one time and, and so it's just learning you know, getting them comfortable with that, saying, look, you just got to keep, you're always hiring, always be replenishing that bench, uh, and, and always have a backup, because they're not going to stay with you long. Like, these are kids mm-hmm. in college, they're, it's their first jobs at high school, like, they're not going to stay with you for 10 years, like, just get used to it. What are some of the the secrets to the business uh, t- for franchisees to look back and see like I was successful with that? Because sometimes you know in franchises it's the it's the labor efficiency. Sometimes it's you just got to get out there and market more. And there's you know a number of different things. Yeah. What is it in in the in this business? We don't have a lead generation problem. Like with the tailwinds in the sector, with what we're doing, like there is so much business. We have a lead conversion and a lead retention problem. Mm-hmm. Like, there is a problem. So, and that all is what happens in those four walls. And the secret sauce is that, that emotional intelligence. If you cannot connect with that pet pair, again, going back to we're watching people's children. Like you have to treat, you have to build trust and you gotta be comfortable with your baby. It, you're gonna be comfortable enough to leave your baby with us for the day or for the week whatever it is, and know that he or she is safe, we're gonna take care of them, and we, and, we're, and we treat them like our own. And that's just building that emotional, that engagement. And so you think of you know, a gas station, there's not a lot of emotional intelligence needed to run a gas station, yep. especially paying at the pump. Uh, you know, in the pizza business, you know, it, there's not a lot of, you know, if you make the pizza, you get it right, you know, great, if, maybe they'll come back, maybe they won't. It's not the end of the day. If you hurt their dog, they will not come back and they will write about you on social media. <laughs> uh, this is a serious game of, you know, again, relating it to childcare. It's that serious. And, and it takes that emotional intelligence. And that's, that's what I look for, number one, is you got to, and if you're that finance guy or, or you know, that nerdy computer tech guy that's been in the background that doesn't like to talk to people, you know, you're prob- it's probably not going to work out with us. Or you've got to hire a GM that is that face. If you're just going to be kind of in the background, that's fine. Because we do have those folks. But you better have a GM who's shaking hands and kissing babies in the front. Do you, you brought up something that I didn't think we're going to, going to go there with like sales process and system and, and warming up the leads and then, you know, basically closing them. And I see sales process as, a, as good sales processes uh, in emerging brands lacking. Like, I just don't see it. Can you tell us like how that evolved? You didn't like, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming like you help the franchisees through every step of the way. Like this is how you greet the dog, you know, and, and, and then, you know, taking them through that whole process. And so I'm you, guessing it wasn't even there to begin with. Are you talking about at the store level, the process, or you mean all level? of it? No, no. At the store level for a franchisee, their sales process, yes. a lead convert. Well, you said a lead conversion. So lead yeah. comes in, what yeah. happens? So and back up, this was changing what we had to do. Part of that, you know, yes. What did you do in the beginning? We didn't have a sales culture. Yep. <clears throat> Our conversion was 30, 40% of the people that walked through the doors. That was it. Now it's 90. Mm-hmm. Nine out of 10, we can close if they walk through the door. And it wasn't a matter of being pushy. It was a matter of asking for it. Like they would tour them in the store. They come in here. What, what, let, me, let me see your pricing. They'd give them the pricing. And then they let them walk out without saying, hey, mm-hmm. you know, they're expecting us to come to them and say, here's what I recommend. Here's the plans. Here's what I recommend for Scruffy. And would you be interested in this? And we can sign you up today. And that was just, it, again, not being pushy, but switching it from, being a nice dog person to, hey, you're here for service. Let's not let them walk out without at least recommending something to yep. And so that was a big shift. And we went out and got uh, one of the best um, consultants that had actually created a lot of the sales um, modules and training for Massage Envy and mm. some of those folks. So uh, they built some of our core core modules early on. So 
that that is part of it is you know again creating a sales culture and and then also creating an environment uh, and giving them the training to be able to do that because a, a common mistake that I could see if someone doesn't know that they should have a sales culture is they get the dog loving culture in there I and they that. think yeah and they think that's more important than the sales culture but you can't you can't have the dog loving culture and have a good experience if you can't get the customers in there in the, in the first place. Right. And um, that, is, that was kind of what I walked into when we took over was uh, there were some of our franchisees that were really lovely, you know, dog people that, you know, had never been in business. And it was like, well, you know, they weren't even doing financial statements. They, there just wasn't, uh, you know, they weren't sophisticated. They were, mm -hmm. they were great people. But then they got into this business because for the love of dogs. Yep. What we've done is kind of taken it a step further and say, hey, love of dogs, you have to have that, but we also want you, this is a business. And we want, and you have to be able to, you have to be able to have strong returns and an ROI and, and let's really start looking at this business model and start attracting, you know, some, some, a little higher sophisticated folks that have that business acumen with the love of dogs plus our support. That's a, that's a winning combination. So just a quick takeaway for anybody that is like a franchise or out there, I think it's super important to have, you know, have help building that sales process, that lead comes in, what do you do with it? And that way it's systematic for all of the franchisees. And it sounds really easy. Yeah. We'll just tell them what to do a simple six step process, but you need to have the right copy out there, the right, the right messaging, and you need to have the right process to be able to take the customer through the, through the journey to buying. And there's sometimes there's technology involved with that and it's, right. it can get really challenging out there. For, and think about it. If, if the franchisees all have to do that themselves, which is typical in emerging brands, they're all doing it themselves. The franchisor can do it at scale. It's probably one of the things that's not on their mind, but it really should be. That's why I'm starting a, a mastermind with a with my friend Beirus Kulian with Fitbody Bootcamp. And one of the things that we're doing is is we are going to help franchisors with the sales process like that because it's just really difficult for them to find really good help like that. Well, it's scary, and you know, and the, number one, there's no such thing as a bad lead. Um, and you look at I'm involved in some other brands, emerging brands, you know, as an investor and. And et cetera, and I just hear a lot. I go to you know these conferences and just hear some of these brands, mm -hmm. and you know, there there's no process in place, and, and and they're letting these leads just fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, they're they're pitching them and just letting them kind of linger out there, and they they need to be you know guided through a process. Mm -hmm. We've heard it over and over again, but you'd be surprised how many brands don't guide them through a process. And, and then ultimately also is, you know, the validation piece. I mean, you, you'd be surprised you can't sell anything unless you have strong validation. Yep. And it was taking, it took a while when you look back at, wow, what did we do in, in 2016? We didn't have that great of validation, but it was, again, the belief of everybody knew that we were going to get better. And it yeah. was, and it was more of, Hey guys, I, you, you know, help me choose the right people to bring into this. It wasn't help me sell. You know, if you go talk to our franchisees back then, it was, hey guys, let's, as a team, let's bring the right folks in. I want to leverage you. Talk to these folks. Are they the right, are they the right candidate for us? If not, give me that feedback. Yeah. I think that's critical for early stage brands. If you don't have good validation, flip it. Ask them to help you bring the right folks in. You know what I mean? And so we can build the brand together. Don't help me sell. <laughs> That's exactly it. Well, um, this, I think anybody that is looking at buying a franchise, they're going to get things in this that like buyer beware, things that they should be looking for in a franchise or, and then franchise or is looking to do what you've done. There's a, there's a bunch of value in there as well. So um, we'll wrap things up. Any last words of wisdom or advice that you would have for anyone? Uh well, from for a fran prospective franchisee, there's a lot of brands out there, you know, over 3,000 <laughs> to choose from. Uh, that's why they come to, to guys like you and mm -hmm. brokers like yourself or consultants that can help narrow that gap and, and choose the right brand. There's only a handful in each category. Um, there's, there's probably only one or two in every category that are worth anything. Yep, that's so true. 
And so you guys are taking the time to, you know, to, to research that. And you, if they're in your inventory, you know, th they're going to be good. So take the time to leverage folks like yourself is what I'd say. Uh, on the franchisor side, uh, if you're a franchisor listening, take the time to invest in your people and your support. If you get that piece right uh, and the unit economics works, uh, then you're going to have no problem scaling as long as you've got the right sales team in place as well. Uh, as we said, there's no such thing as a bad lead or a bad candidate. It's just bad follow-up or direction. Yep. I, um, I think that is some, some sound advice. Um, people like really need to listen to that. It's so easy to get caught up up, you look at a magazine, you look online and you can just, you can waste a ton of time. And so um, I think that's why we have people like you on here. People are listening. It resonates with them. Reach out to the Dogtopia and, and then, you know, they'll be working with you directly. Um, so uh, I appreciate the time today, Alex, and um, I'll see you around at one of these conferences at some point, right? <laughs> exactly.